Now, of course, the highlight of the 1858 Senate race in Illinois is the great Lincoln-Douglas debates. Um, and uh, there are excerpts from it in the Janap book of, uh, of, of documents. Um, much Now, what was the Lincoln-Douglas debate? We're, we're used to presidential debates. Do you remember in 2012, 2000, I don't know. The, the presidential debates today are completely absurd. They're TV spectacles. The Lincoln-Douglas debates were debates. They didn't have a Tom Brokaw or someone yakking at them with questions. They had, the first guy got up and spoke for an hour. Then the other guy got up and spoke for an hour and a half. Then the first one had a right to rebut for another half hour. So it's three hours of speeches. It's not individual give and take, although occasionally they interrupted each other. Thousands of people came to hear these debates. Thousands. They stood there. They didn't have seats. They stood there for three hours listening to these politicians talk about the, the future of the nation, basically. I mean, some of them was scurrilous, some of it was intemperate, some of it was fraudulent, accusing each other of different things. Um, Lincoln accused Douglas of plotting with Buchanan to spread slavery. Well, that seemed ridiculous since Buchanan was opposing Douglas and trying to undermine his campaign. Douglas accused, basically just accused Lincoln of believing in Negro equality. That was the main thing, not slavery. Forget about slavery. The issue is Negro equality. Lincoln is going to flood Illinois with black people. They're going to come up here and marry your daughters and all this. It, very, very explicit appeals to racism. In fact, when Douglas died in 1861, Frederick Douglas, no relation, the great black abolitionist, <laughs> said, no man has done more to increase racial prejudice in America than Stephen A. Douglas. That was his campaign, so to speak, as well as, you know, he defended popular sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. But the debates were the first real indication of the political impact of the Dred Scott decision. Um, and it raised the fundamental issues facing the country. Um, most of what Lincoln, the, the, this whole study of Lincoln and race is a very interesting example of historical scholarship and the pitfalls thereof. One of my great old professors, John A. Garrity, had a phrase where he said, a trend in your note cards, people don't use them anymore, but we used to keep notes on little index cards and put them in a shoebox and line them up. A trend in your note cards is not a trend in history. In other words, you can line up a whole lot of quotes, and they seem to create a great pattern. And you, here they all are. It's amazing. But in fact, they're decontextualized. Everyone lines up the same quotes by Lincoln. For, when I was working my book, one day I said, you know, actually, Lincoln didn't say very much about race. Here they are. Everyone knows the same five quotes. They're all from the campaign of 1858. They're all responses to Douglas's attacks. Yes, he says, I'm not in favor of blacks voting. I'm not, but Lincoln is not a guy who raised the issue of race in his campaigns. He responded. But the fact is, this is the hardest thing to understand. Race is not an intellectual category of great importance to Lincoln. He reads pro-slavery doctrine. He does not read racist doctrine, which is floating around scientific racism, religious racism. Lincoln's not interested in that. He's, it's just not a major category, intellectual category for Lincoln. That was the hardest thing to realize. The sentence in my book that is probably the most quoted and puzzling to reviewers, which I put in in order to annoy them, was <laughs> race is our obsession, not Lincoln's. We want to know what did Lincoln think about this. But we are imposing that question, so to speak, on Lincoln. Lincoln I'm not saying Lincoln did not share the prejudices of his time. Of course he did. But race was just not, not a major factor in his thinking. Uh, that enables him later to change to a more somewhat egalitarian position. But anyway, um, so Lincoln responds, and the debates go on and on. Lincoln tries to drive the wedge in the Democratic Party deeper he says that the Dred Scott decision has destroyed popular sovereignty because if the Supreme Court says 
people have a right to take their slaves into the territories? How can there be a vote on it? Douglas, of course, comes off with this so-called Freeport Doctrine, where he says, look, yes, they cannot bar it, but slavery needs positive legislation to protect it. If the, leg if the territory refuses to pass laws protecting slavery, you'll never have slavery out there. Well, Southerners hear that, and they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Supreme Court just gave us a constitutional right and now Douglas is saying, well, they can take that right away by not protecting it. Therefore, what? Therefore, Congress has to protect that right. This is the begin the, in response to Douglas, they begin demanding a congressional slave code for the territories. Congress must make sure that this right to bring slaves is recognized in all these territories. That is something no northerner will accept, Douglas or anyone else. In the last debates, Lincoln moves to the, you might say, the strongest suit, really, which is the moral attack on slavery. The real issue, he says, is basically, is slavery right or wrong? That's the question here. That's not a political position. That's the abolitionist position. Is slavery right or wrong? Is, are black people human beings? Douglas, he says, conveys no vivid impression that the Negro is human and consequently has no idea there can be a moral question in legislating about him. So uh, if you believe slavery is wrong, vote for me. If you believe slavery is not wrong, you can vote for Douglas. Well, in the end, Lincoln is not elected, of course. Um, the, the Republicans actually win more votes in the, in the elections. There's only one, it's like the Secretary of State or some other state official is up, and the Republicans win that race by about 125,000 to 121,000. And if you add up all the votes in the different legislative districts, Republicans get more votes than Democrats. But the Illinois legislature is apportioned according to the census of 1850. Remember, the legislatures are only reapportioned every 10 years due to the census. Since 1850, large numbers of people have poured into northern Illinois, but the legislative apportionment does not reflect that. So even though Democrats win fewer votes, they, they retain control of the Illinois legislature. And therefore, Douglas is reelected to the Senate, and uh, Lincoln's campaign is, is unsuccessful. But now he is a national figure. Now people have heard of him. Um, nobody is really thinking of him as a presidential candidate at this point, except a few pals of his in Illinois. Um, early in 1860, Lincoln is invited to come to New York City to deliver an address. First, actually, it was supposed to be in Brooklyn, but then there was sufficient, in, I think at Plymouth Church, Henry Ward Beecher's church, but anyway, there's sufficient interest that it was moved to Cooper Union, Cooper Institute in downtown, in Astor Place, downtown New York. It's still there. And in fact, the, the great hall of Cooper Institute is sort of renovated since then, but it's still there. And I, I've taken part in public events there. It's a great hall. Uh, and um, Lincoln gives his great Cooper Union address, which is really meant to introduce himself to political leaders in the East. Because even at this late date, he's still mostly a Westerner. He's well known in Illinois, in Indiana, in Ohio. In the East, they know he debated Douglas, but he's still a bit of a shadowy character. People don't know what to expect. They think he's going to come with, I don't know, a, a frontier coonskin cap, you know, and uh, an ax on his shoulder or something. Lincoln turns up in a rather ill-fitting suit. He's not a clothes horse, to say the least. And, um, and he gives this Cooper Union address, which is devoted to uh, explaining or d dis discussing the views of the founding fathers about slavery. It's like a master's thesis. It's a weird speech. Because it's all, it's, he goes through the early debates in the Constitutional Convention and in the early Congresses, and he takes all the people who signed the Constitution and then tries to see how they voted on different issues relating to slavery. The point being that 
preventing the westward expansion of slavery is a conservative measure. It is a measure to, that is in line with the original views of the founding fathers. The people like Douglas who are trying to upend that are the real political radicals. When the Cooper Union Address is published, it has footnotes to these, as I say, it's like a master's thesis. How many political speeches have footnotes to the debates in the, convention, in the Constitutional Convention, et cetera? But again, Lincoln, so we're conservatives, he said. Republicans are conservatives. They accuse us of trying to break up the union. No, we are trying to keep the country on its original path of restricting slavery and putting it on the road to ultimate extinction. But again, he ends on this moral note. If slavery is right, all words, acts, laws, and constitutions against it are wrong and should be swept away. All we ask, we could readily, all they ask, sorry, all they, the South ask, we could readily grant if we thought slavery right. All we ask, they could readily grant if they thought it wrong. Their thinking it right and our thinking it wrong is the precise fact on which depends the whole controversy. And if that is the case, how can there ever be a solution? How can there ever be a solution if the fundamental issue is one group thinks slavery is wrong and one group thinks slavery is right? How can that be compromised? It's half wrong and half right? That doesn't seem to make much sense. The, the Cooper Union speech was a great success. Many Easterners who didn't like some of the other candidates thought now that Lincoln was a plausible possibility for president. And what we will see next time is how Lincoln actually does get to be nominated and elected. But between, a little bit before Cooper Union, another major personality of this period launches himself onto the scene, and that is John Brown. So next time we'll start by talking about John Brown and then the election of Lincoln.